what chairs want. want, right? Which is something that everybody should be thinking about all the time, OK? My life would be easier. I'm a chair. It would be easier if everybody was thinking about what chairs want all the time, OK? And so I'm always excited when I get to hire a teaching position um, because t people who fill teaching positions help me fulfill the teaching mission of the department. And not everybody in my department is interested in fulfilling the teaching mission in my department. And so teachers are, and that's great. So um, when I get one of these, I think one of the things about chairs is that you get to become chair and you get appointed as chair because you do care about the um, discipline, the how, how to get people enthused about the discipline, and how to make sure that the discipline is taught correctly, and how to make sure that undergraduates have a great experience in your discipline. So chairs are teaching faculties, colleagues, and mentors, and helpers. We want teaching faculties to succeed. But that being said, I think even though a lot of different uh, institutions and departments have different needs and goals and obviously different size, teaching positions are often given out for the same reasons, okay, but to fulfill particular needs. And I would say that when I'm talking to my colleagues across the country who are in community colleges or the big public systems like the UC or smaller public systems like Cal State or community college or regional colleges, they all agree on the same thing, that there are too few teaching positions and too few teaching resources. And that might make it sound great for the people who are looking for them, except that it means that um, every time I hire someone in that position, that person needs to check off a lot of boxes. Okay, I need to make that position count in a million different ways that I don't think about when I hire a research faculty member. Okay, research faculty, you have to do research. And you have to do a few other things, but you have to do research. But for a teacher, there's a lot, a lot of boxes. So what do chairs want? We want a lot, okay? And um, I'm hoping that I'm gonna talk about these. I think that the general themes that I hear from chairs across the country in different departments about what we were really looking for, and they're boxes that aren't always going to be the boxes that attracted you to teaching, okay? So I'm going to be brutally realistic in some of what I say here, and I'm hoping by doing that, I'll be able to help you get some of these positions, and when you get the position, keep the position forever, because that's really what you want to do. Because one of the sadder, crueler things about teaching positions are that by and large they are not as permanent as research positions. And that I think is a, a, ver a very negative thing about academia in general. It's not as true in, I think, li small liberal, selective liberal arts colleges who have a nice even balance between research and, and teaching, maybe they have it right, okay? But they're a minority of the positions out there. So, well, I'm gonna talk about six boxes that I want checked off. Fondness for fundamentals, crowd control capability, engagement effectiveness, innovative initiative, diversity dedication, and people people, and wonderful use of alliteration. Okay? <laughs> so let's go through this. Fondness of fundamentals. Who's finishing off their dissertation? Who's working on their dissertation? Or has done the dissertation? Give me, a, give me the title of your dissertation. Um, into virtual okay, somebody else. Give me. Who was over here? Title of their dissertation. Okay. Powerful marginality, comics and feminist theory. Isn't that great? Those are great topics, right? And you guys just became experts in them. And they were also long titles. They were long titles because you're in a specialty area. It's, you can't just say feminism. You can't just say <laughs> biology. Okay, you're an expert in something and you've just put a lot of, lot of effort and time into becoming an expert in it and I hate to tell you but I don't care, okay? <laughs> what I want you to teach, what, what you need to teach are the pre-major classes, the lower division classes, the GE classes, the basics of a discipline, okay? Introduction to cultural anthropology, principles of physical geology, Western Civ, okay? Literature and its uses. 
calculus in all its very many flavors, all right? So when you look at the course catalog, and I recommend you do this if you're looking for a teaching position at an institution, look at their course catalog and anything that's numbered between 2 and 10 are your bread and butter, okay? We need the basics. We need, we need a lot of positions are given because of the number of people who need to be taught. And this is where the number of people need to be taught. The second big, big bread and butter area for teachers for me are tools of the trade, okay? Because we need to teach people skills that they use throughout the rest of their degree and then that they use throughout the rest of their life and heaven forbid that they get a job and that they might have some skills, okay? So tools of the trade, methods and labs, all right? I need people, I know that on this campus, uh, the, the lecturers with security of employment, so, so teaching positions that are long term, are focused in the labs in chemistry, teaching the intro labs in chemistry, in research methods in almost every discipline, in the language labs, in fields that have to be taught statistics, field methods, ethno ethnogra ethnography, computational linguistics, all these kinds of how you do something in a discipline. That's where um, chairs need teaching faculty because the research faculty are teaching in their courses with the long titles of specialty areas, right? So these are what you need to be doing. And I've put flexibility here, but I probably mean flexibility and versatility. The more of them you can do, the more interesting you are to a chair, all right? If you've, got, if you've got the basics, lecture, you can lecture in the basics, and you can teach methods, and you can teach labs, and you've got techniques, you can teach people things, you're going to make my heart go pitter patter when I look at your, um, <laughs> when, you, when I look at your application. So fondness for fundamentals. It doesn't mean that you won't ever get to teach a class in your specialty area, but that's not what I'm hiring you for first. Lead with these, okay? Here's another one. I mean, I listened to your presentations today, and I read a lot of the CCAT, all of the CCAT um, portfolios, and I'm blown away by how great you guys are and the techniques that you use in classes, all right? You are passionate about engaging people in conversations, getting to learn your students' names, understanding them as people, meeting them for coffee afterwards, okay? That's wonderful. I'm going to assign you to a class that has 900 kids in it. And then next quarter, you'll teach the same class that has 700 kids in it. And then in spring quarter, I'm going to teach you, you're going to teach Psych 1 again. And it's only got 500 because that's the way it goes in Psych 1, 900, 700, 500, OK? You're not going to learn all their names. They're not even going to come every time, OK? So you're not always going to be teaching 900. On a good day, you might teach 7, OK? If you're a really good teacher, you'll teach 800. But so you're going to teach larger, bigger, and truly huge classes in the setting. Obviously, that's not true in a small liberal arts, but even in a small liberal arts place, if you're being hired because of a particular need, it's probably going to be at the lower division and relatively bigger size of classes than, um, than, than the small specialty classes. So I need you to be able to stand up and talk in front of a crowd. Okay, I, you know, I, I hate to get personal, but if you're a shy person, being a teacher in a big institution is probably pain every day, all right? You need to be able to stand up and talk to people. You also need to be organized. And this is, again, this is like, what, did I train to be a teacher for the, for the basics of organization? No, you didn't. But if you don't order the textbook on time, you ruin my life, and I don't want you to ruin my life, okay? I, had, I hired a lecturer who was teaching two large courses, and he ordered the first course's textbook for the second course, and the second course's textbook for the first course. This person had a PhD, you know? I mean, one, two different courses, title, titles matched. No, the title didn't match. Covered that. The guy at the bookstore who paid enough attention to call me and say, you know, this guy's ordering a book on cognitive psychology, but the course he's teaching is research method. So, okay, so it's just, 
chairs need you to be organized. You need to answer the 700 emails from students, right? You need to, you need to get done what needs to get done. The, the exam needs to be written in time and copied in time and turn up at the right place. And that's your concern. Because if it becomes my concern, I think, hmm, next quarter, I'm not sure that I'm going to be calling on this person to teach this class again. So, you know, and can you write good multiple choice questions? Because I know there are lots of great ways to assess people, but if, I, if you're, I'm assigning you to a class of 700 people, are you going to read 700 five-page essays? Probably not if you want to survive, because remember, I'm getting you to teach two other courses at the same time. So, you know, these are some skills to think about. If you're going to be in a system like ours, there's crowd control issues that you have to deal with. There's also quality control, right? You are probably going to be one of the first people who introduce students to my discipline, to the major's discipline. And so even though I'm making you work really hard and I'm putting you in this really difficult position, I want you to do it really well. I want you to maintain the quality of the, um, of the standards of the department. And often that's going to be put you in a position where you, you probably don't want to defend some of them. So for example, I'm going to give you a lot of examples from psych and brain sciences because that's where I teach. But we teach uh, preparation for the major courses every quarter, sometimes twice a quarter, year after year. But not always the same person, and they're really important to do, you have to do well on them to get into the major, right? But the same person doesn't teach them all the time. So years ago, we decided that what we needed was what is actually called the equivalence of grading policy in psych, but everybody knows it as the curve, all right? Mm -hmm. And so we designated a certain percentage of students in every, in every class would get A, a B, a C, and a D, so that people who took it from an easy grader wouldn't have a better chance of getting into the major, okay? There aren't a lot of pedagogical reason, reasons for a curve, okay? Research actually shows that it, 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 it demotivates people, okay? But we need it to happen. And I can't have you stand up in front of a class and say, this sucks, and they made me do this, and I don't know if you care about this class, but it doesn't matter because 20 of you are going to fail anyway. All right? So you just can't do that. All right? So I need quality control even as I'm putting you in somewhat of a different position. I also need you, I talked earlier about people skills. I need you to be able to have authority over others. I need you to be able to deal with students. And that's, you, you, you've all been TAs, right? It can be very difficult especially in a large context. But when you say, we're going to ha have a paper, and a hundred of the students put up their hands and say, no, it's not unfair, I can't write it. And you say, OK, OK, we won't have a paper. We'll do a multiple choice test. And then the other 200 say, no, that's terrible. I don't do multiple choice. I need to be able to show who I am in a paper, right? And, and you're there going back and forth. You can't do that. I need you to be able to say, I'm a teacher, here's my syllabus, my syllabus is pedagogically correct, I stand behind the decisions I've made, and this is what we're doing. I'll give you the tools, I'll help you in every way, but this is how I'm going to assess you. And as I also mentioned um, earlier, you're, you're probably going to work with teaching assistants. They're probably going to be a year younger than you, or two years younger than you. You might have even been in graduate school with them, right? We have people who graduate and then get to be a lecturer in the department that they just graduated from and some of their best buds are now their teaching assistants. How do you handle that, right? I need you to handle it in a really professional manner because everything that you do wrong comes to me, okay? <laughs> and you do not want the chair to associate your name with pain and suffering <laughs> and disorganization and staying awake at night wondering how to do things, okay? <laughs> so this is something that you probably don't think about when you thought you were going to have a great teaching career, but it's showing that you have done this and that you can do this and that you're competent, that really reassures me when I'm, when I'm looking at your um, applications. So um, 
I will say that it is increasingly true that I don't trust people who say they can do that unless they really have. All right? And at UCSB, you often get the chance at least to TA a class like that, but you don't always get the chance to teach it. If you can, if you want to be a teacher, I would say try to, in the summers, if you don't get a chance at UCSB, go to City College. See if you can actually be an instructor. Okay, because being a TA is just playing at being an instructor in many ways. Okay, in some ways it's more important. In some ways the TAs actually do a lot more of the actual teaching and interaction work than the le lecturers. But in terms of, of the things that we were just talking about, the crowd control abilities, TAs don't have to deal with those, but instructors do. So the more actual experience you can get, the more that puts you up and up and up on my list. Okay. Here's something that you're really good at. Okay, and everything, everything today, I'll put all of these up here because you've all talked about them. Um, these are things that you that do did draw you to teaching, and many of you are very good at it because you want to be teachers. But at the same time that you have to exercise crowd control and quality control, I need you to engage the students. Okay, we need to teach them really well, and. Most of the time, the teaching faculty are better teachers than the research faculty. That's not always true, because there are some amazing teachers among the research faculty. Okay? I can name them. Many of our, the faculty in our department have won teaching awards. But by and large, the teaching faculty are better at these things than the research faculty are, and I love you for it. Okay? So engage them. All the things that all of these talks have been on, everything that you can do, see cut. Participate in, in all the training that instructional development gives you, right? Demand experience from your departments because anything that you can do to do these things is going to make you a fantastic applicant, okay? And I add on the interaction and collaboration because increasingly it's important for you to teach the students how to share their toys and work in groups because that's what people want. All right? That's what employers want. That's what research teams are made up of now. Okay? But, but you know, at, most people in, a, in an undergraduate program are not going to become academics, thank goodness. Okay? <laughs> but they're going to go out into the workforce. And that's what employers want. Right? No, there's no solitary employment anymore. You work together with people to get things done. So not only do you have to get them involved and make them active and, and you know, learning on every level and, and, and in every medium, but I want you to teach them to be able to interact and work together as well. And of course, it's called lots of different things, but really you're teaching them how to learn, right? Your knowledge in almost every field is changing so fast. I mean, perhaps not, well, even history, I guess, gets rewritten. Um, but it's certainly in the STEM fields Knowledge is changing so fast that what you know now, you won't be teaching people in five years' time or ten years' time. It'll all be different, okay? But so you're teaching students how to learn. That's more important than anything. So any evidence that you can give me, lesson plans. You know, one one thing that always stands out for me, who's in applications for teaching, are people who have actually had lesson plans published in teaching of psychology or teaching of all the disciplines. Or, or send me a lesson plan, or send me some of the, again, I'm, I'm sort of drumming on CCUT, but some of the um, examples of things that people put in, in the CCUT when they're including their portfolio, that's fantastic, okay? That really shows that you know how to do things. The presentations earlier about how to engage identity, how to get people scaffolding, that's, that's the kinds of things that, that we love to see. Okay. And not only that, you know, how many, how many tasks have I made you responsible for? But not only that, but if you can also make in, uh, undergraduates connected in an identity sense to the major, that is such a fantastic contribution to my community that I will love you forever, okay? My best teaching faculty, I, I'm, I'm giving you the good and the bad examples here, um, one of our best teaching faculty, the first thing that she did when she joined 
was that she created an undergraduate club. Mm -hmm. She created uh, undergraduate psychologists at UCSB. It was, it's fantastic, okay? We had no, we're a huge major, okay? When, when I'm being absolutely honest, we're a, we're a degree mill. At least we get them through, right? But it, it is like a class, 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 lab, class, class, graduate, goodbye, all right? <laughs> and then she got, she's gotten them involved. They have an identity as a psychology major, and that's wonderful, okay? So if you can do that kind of thing as well, that makes you stand out. Now, obviously, you won't have done all of this, but it's not, but you know, you can talk about the importance of identity and how this is, this would be a way, if there was, if it was possible, if an opportunity arose, that this would be something that you would like to start. A journal club, same thing, right? Just something that makes people proud to be uh, majors rather than just getting the degree. All right, innovation. You've got this down too. This is what this, the whole day about is today, you know all of these, um, you know all of the latest things to do, particularly in technology. I mean, chairs have faculty who are still sort of grappling with email, right? How does email work? Okay, so the fact that you, so the, I mean, mass, mass mental crises when we change the email system, right? So, so, so you, not that generation and and you will and neither are the students of course and so you will bring technology in innovation you've got this snapchat you the instagram i had a student who used tinder to um in a relationships class all right as a did a little experiment on tinder was great the can you imagine the level of involvement in that class right <laughs> other people i've got i had another um teacher who used mturk the the um, Amazon-based uh, job source uh, platform to run surveys on things, all right? So that, those kinds of things. We're not even talking eye clickers, right? Eye clickers is sort of kind of like PowerPoint now. I mean, if you don't use them, we don't understand why, but so to say, I use eye clickers, okay, right, you could tell me why you use them in a really good way. But again, this is the, the technology is, is changing so fast. And, it, and I don't want bells and whistles. Right? I want you to be using things in a principled way to get people involved, okay? Especially if you can do it in a way that they are going to use the technology themselves, not to get dates, okay? But use the technology themselves beyond college. So that's great, technology. Even more important, I need to know that you keep up with innovations in the science of learning, okay? You need to be able to sh demonstrate to me that you no have knowledge of effective practices, all right? And remember, I th for those of you who were in the other section, uh, the, the faculty panel, and we were talking about asking for resources that would fit the mission of the institution. This is the kind of thing that we're talking about. How do you know what uh, effective practices are? How are you going to keep up with that? Um, how are you going to... Uh, keep on learning as well as teaching, right? And that's, that's a really important thing for me. Um, is, so if I, say, if I say to somebody when they come, uh, like on, the, on a Zoom interview or when they come in, I say, you know what, how, how would you work um, the testing effect into your syllabus? And their eyes kind of go wide and they're like, what? What's the testing of it? I mean, I just expect people to know that, right? Because that's kind of a new basic principle. The testing effect is that it's much more effective to be tested over and over again. I just read an article about, uh, you know, we, we, it's pretty common knowledge now that um, people don't use the right, students don't use the right study principles, right? So a lot of research has been put into getting them to do other things, but they don't want to do other things. So this was a great paper showing how to sort of get them to nudge them just a little bit to use the wrong things they were doing to be more effective, right? So those are the kinds of things. And again, this is sort of an added, an added value kind of thing. Administrations all over the country for completely wrong-headed reasons love hybrid and online classes, okay? They, they think it saves money, which it clearly does not. It's actually way more expensive. But one tip for a teaching 
people and young people in the field, don't try and change administrators' minds about anything. Don't try to convince them that they're wrong. It's impossible, right? Um, so go with the flow. If you, if you are, are the kind of person who could develop this, if you have these kinds of skills, it's, an, it's another arrow in your quiver. Diversity dedication, I'd say the same thing for you guys. You know this stuff. It's what you've been talking about all day. And again, it's asking a lot. But if you're the kind of person or have the kind of family life that makes it possible, that you can actually make some con con connections out of the classroom, again, added value. You know, So lots of places have uh, dinner with the faculty kinds of activities or you know, UCSB and IV kind of activities. If you can do those, I'm, I'm always a little wary about pushing them because some people have families, right? And you, you were talking, Damon was talking about presence, being present. And some people have responsibilities that make it harder to be present. And uh, thank goodness departments are getting more sensitive to that. But if you can, what you can do, that's all good. All right, and then this is really just a bunch of things that I didn't know where to put together. Um, so I, you have to be a people person, I think. I really want a people person to be a teacher, right? You have to like people. Why do you want to teach people if you don't like people, all right? If, you, if, you, if your main goal in life is to avoid ever having contact with an undergraduate, you're not going to be a good teacher. I hope that's not a surprise to you. So I, you know, you have to, you, and you have to be a team player, especially at first. You are the low person on the totem pole. I am going to give the senior faculty member who's a distinguished professor the class that she wants in winter at 11 o'clock, and you're going to get the class that you didn't want to teach in fall at 8 a.m. in the morning. Okay, and that's life. It, it, sorry, it's, but it's going to be. So you have to be a team player. You have to strong into, and you have to keep on keeping in there, right? What, what, were, the best, what were the best presentations today? Were, they were the ones with high energy levels and enthusiasm. And I'm going to give you three classes of 500 people each, and you're going to do it again next quarter, and you're going to do it again next quarter. And so you have to have resiliency and enthusiasm, all right? And of course, I'm not going to know that, that you can cope with that until after I've hired you for a year. But a lot of people show it in the interview and everything. I think David's going to be a high energy person. Okay, David just goes off in, in, his, cl in his classroom, right? So I'm not. Pre I'm predicting that David is going to be a high energy teacher from his presentation. I don't think that he's going to give a presentation like that and then say, mm, "Next week we'll be working from chapter two." <laughs> <laughs> I hope everybody's read it. So, okay. <laughs> your, col your colleagues, your colleagues, and you're a bigger part of the community, all right? And so a lot of people talked about identity and fitting in with the institution. You know a lot about the institution from, I hope you do, I hope you just didn't spray out application letters out there, that, but you learned a little bit about why you wanted a job at this place. And so fit in with the community. And then, the, you know, the, the last thing I would say here is that you are good teachers. And all of these things have been about me, what I want, right? And what I need from you, and the kind of person you should be if you're a good teacher. But I also respect when you know you're a good teacher. You have talent. You have these, you've got these things. You can offer me these things. Tell me that you've got these things. You have to want to do this, right? The, the, re the big red flag in hiring a teacher, and I think Damon will say the same thing, is I really wanted to, be, to get a Nobel Prize in biology, but I only got five things published during graduate school. I applied to six research jobs, but nobody wanted me. So now I really want a teaching job. Yeah, oh, yeah, I love to have you be my, you're right, a, a, miserable, a miserable person whose life hasn't turned out well. Yes, come on board. You'll be fine. <laughs> All right? So uh, what do chairs want? Obviously, everything. And what I would say is think about what you want. Find your niche. Be resilient because, look, even if you wanted to be a research professor, 
you have to you have to be resilient. It's not all it's cracked up to be. Okay, and then remember that you're incredibly valuable. Okay, thank you. So let's take a couple questions, if there are questions. Yes. Um, I was just curious, so what if there was a candidate who I, who was, I guess, quote unquote good, but just didn't meet all the marks that you were talking about? Oh, nobody can meet all of these. This is like what, you know, what do chairs want? It's like, a, you know, what do you want in a partner written in Cosmo magazine, right? <laughs> those, those people do not exist out there, okay? Give me five of them, okay? But, but I've, you know, and again, it depends on the institution. When I'm, when I'm hiring someone just to, just to teach because I need them to teach, then it's probably the first two. Teach anything I want you to, teach lots of it, do it professionally and don't make my life and the thousands of undergraduates you're teaching lives miserable, okay? But if, you're, if, you're, if it's a teaching, like a permanent teaching position and, or a Damon's hiring you, then I think the balance might go the other way. And it's, you know, it's the engagement, it's the ability to engage and innovate and to, and to meet your students halfway and to, to develop something together. And maybe I would take a chance on uh, you being able to learn the basics of research methods in a year. Okay. okay. We're going to go one more question, and then you'll be able to find. Uh, considering the six points uh, that you made out, uh, how how would you make a CV stand out? How would you make your CV stand out on yes. them? I don't know. Use the alliteration. It's kind of cool, isn't it? <laughs> no, um, I would I I would lead with the I would lead with the engagement and the innovation and the dedication, the affinity for teaching things. Um, but somewhere close to the top, I would say, and I can teach research methods and statistics and the basics. And I'm comfortable in all of these, right? Because that's meeting the need as well as the aspirations. Thank you once again.